Thank you. I'm glad to see many friendly faces. This is going to be easy. So, um, my plan is to talk for no more than half an hour, and then everybody can talk back. Okay? Um, and uh, Walter did a wonderful job of giving the formal genesis of the paper, so now I'm going to give you the informal genesis of the paper. Um, about five years ago, um, a good friend of mine, Cliff Christians, asked if I would become involved in a group that now calls itself the Global Media Ethics Scholars. Um, uh, what we do is we go to different places on the planet and um, try to involve um, local folks in a discussion of ethics and journalism and media ethics. Um, for those of you who don't know Cliff, and I only think there's two people in the room who may not, um, Cliff's project, his lifelong project, is the search for universals which is a pretty tough nut to crack philosophically. And then when you put media in there, you get not only the philosophical issues, but also the very practical applied issues of different social systems, different political systems, and, and whatnot. But nonetheless, uh, Cliff enabled all of us to go to uh, Stellenbosch, South Africa uh, in 2009 for the first of these, and since then, um, we've gone to, um, in addition to Stellenbosch, we went to Dubai, uh, we went to New Delhi, um, this one was in Beijing, and I'm glad Matt is sitting down because the next one is in Sri Lanka in January. Um, and each of us, there's a, there's a core group, and each of us have sort of picked a way of getting at the notion of universals. Uh, everybody does it very differently. So, for example, my colleague Herman Wasserman, who teaches at Rose University right now, um, Herman is very much all about taking that South African experience and see if he can see if he can generalize it to other nations and other conflicts and so forth and so on. I, on the other hand, decided that what I was going to start sort of start chipping away at was how our very, very contemporary understandings of neuroscience might enable us to say something global about how people think about ethics. Um, so I've taken a very sort of, um, I guess you could call it biological and organic approach. And each of the papers that I've done in response to this has either a tiny amount, that would be this paper, or a fairly big chunk of neuroscience in it as I've been, I've been trying to, um, to learn it. Um, the other interesting thing about, about this, I have to tell you, this paper in my house is called the China Paper. When, my husband's, when I say the China Paper, my husband absolutely knows what it is I'm talking about, um, was the political issue of trying to go to a country that I've had many, many students from, but I've never traveled to before, in a political system that is very unlike my own in a media system that is very unlike my own, and trying to say something relatively constructive and to not set people's teeth on edge in a, in a cultural way. Um, and so one of the really fun things about the conference at Tsinghua University was the uh, faculty member who had arranged it had done something that I think is pretty hard to do even in contemporary China, she had scholars, not just the, the core media ethics group, but she had scholars there from Taiwan and from Hong Kong. So although we got Asia, we didn't get all just mainland China points of view. Um, the other interesting thing to us that she did was, um, yes, it is China. Yes, there are politics. And so for the entire conference, I got to sit next to the very nice gentleman who, now that I'm not in China and I can say this differently, has the power to throw journalists in jail. And it was very interesting to sit next to him and to hear his responses because his PhD is from the University of Minnesota. So we could talk a little bit in English. Um, and to hear his responses to some of what the rest of us were saying and to sort of have this background dialogue in your head about, you know, here's the guy who can and has made people go away, made journalists go away for doing what I think is their job. Um, so that's the deep context for this paper. Um, the topic I picked was courage. And um, I have one more, actually two more things to say about that. Um, although this paper is philosophic, um, I think we would all be a little bit disingenuous if we didn't say that sometimes life informs the scholarship. 
So much of this paper is inspired by my stepmom, who is very courageously facing Alzheimer's. And I learned a lot about courage from watching her. The other thing I want to say is that um, I was trying to give the journalists in the room something to work with. Um, even though this paper is somewhat theoretical, there are some places in it that I think are pretty applied. So with that kind of context, I'll just kind of roar off, okay? And then I will sit down and shut up 25 minutes from now, okay? Um, I am not a virtue ethicist. In fact, if there is a part of classical ethical theory that I feel least drawn to, it is virtue ethics. Um, so this paper begins, and my thinking has always begun about virtue ethics with the notion that character, unlike the way the Greeks thought of it as something sort of, you know, you're, it's fixed, it's unchangeable, that sort of thing, I think character is much more developmental. I think it's much more fungible. And I also think it's not one thing in the way that the Greeks and Aristotle and even Confucius talked about it. I think of it more as, as a heuristic. It's, it's a bundle of things that we sort of lock into one noun that allows us to say, well, this is a person of good character who opens the door. <laughs> Sorry, the door's locked. It's okay. <laughs> Um, the notion that character is a heuristic, um, I would like to say it's original with me, but of course it's not. Um, other scholars who've written about it say that character <coughs> implies consistency of traits, stability of traits over time, and an integration of traits into a whole. Um, so that we tend to say that people are of good character, and we mean a lot of things by that. You know, they don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't steal, they're faithful to their partners, they don't keep their dog, um, you know, you name it. You know, it's sort of that, it's sort of that constellation of things. Um, Aristotle and Nicomachean Ethics, for those of you who've, who've read that book or who haven't read that book, um, one of the things I really like about that book is it's a bunch of many essays on things that we don't talk about very much in contemporary society. So for example, I think it has the three best pages on gluttony ever, uh, because Aristotle is trying to talk about character in a very expansive, uh, in an expansive sort of way. But I think the, the important thing about character, especially for philosophers, is that what it says is that in a deep way, human beings know who they're dealing with. And that, I do believe, is the result of character. Um, and and it, it's hard to put that in any other terms, but I think it, it, it makes common sense in terms of how we go through life. Um, as many of you know, there's a lot of social science out there that has put the whole notion of character under really serious assault. Um, you know, everything from the Stanford prison experience, experiments to um, the Nazi doctors, uh, to um, lots of stuff that's, that's come up in how science is conducted. So even though on the one hand, the Greeks say there's this thing, it's called character, it's unchangeable, it's immutable, there's a lot of social science evidence that suggests that when people get put under certain kinds of pressures, our character is not as firmly attached to us as we might otherwise like. Um, and what that means, I think, for contemporary philosophy is, is that there are some contemporary philosophers that are really in the process now of having what I think is a pretty interesting discussion about, well, what did we really mean when we said the concept of character? And a couple of those whom I found really informative are a guy by the name of Robert Audi, um, who talks about character as three different kinds of responsibility. Um, the first is what he calls generative responsibility, or the notion that you generate traits about which you're responsible. Then he calls, um, then he says, you add to that retentional responsibility. You're responsible for retaining those traits. And then last but not least, he calls prospective responsibility. In other words, you're responsible also for looking out there and saying, OK, um, my moral character is pretty flabby, which is what I tell all my ethics students on the very first day of class. So one of the things I'm really working hard on is how can I exercise that character muscle, which is the way Aristotle conceived of it, so that my character gets stronger. Um, Aristotle's contention, and I think this is a 
this is profound, is that characters like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the more likely it's going to be that it will serve you well when times get tough. If you're used to telling the truth, and then you're presented with an opportunity to lie, that habit of truth-telling may begin to carry you through. Um, Audi says something I think is really important. He says, it, meaning character, can arise from the ashes of vice as well as from virtue. Um, and I think that that is a really good human insight, okay? And it gives you the sense that people can grow and they can change. Feminist philosophers have added another sort of ant quirk to all of this, um, where they say that the character, oh, let me back up a little bit. For Aristotle, character was basically a single bold act. In fact, Aristotle in Nicomachean Ethics talks about lot, a lot about character in war. Um, so the notion is that you will, you will reason through what it's right to die for. Um, Aristotle is also, also one of few philosophers who links character with an emotion. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But the emotion that he links character with is fear. Uh, I, not character, the emotion he links courage with is fear. Um, and, and because he's Aristotle and he's dead and he's Greek and he wore a toga and all that other sort of stuff, what he said has influenced people for the next 3,000 years. Um, it, 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 I mean, with good reason. Um, philosophers agree that character is a bulwark to the environment. It can also be highly susceptible to an environment. And there is an element of professional ethics that looks particularly at the impact of organizations on character, um, whether that organization is a concentration camp or a Murdoch publication. And yes, I did put those two things in the same sentence for a very good reason. Um, OK, so now let me talk to you a little bit about courage. Aristotle said that courage was a kind of knowledge, that it wasn't just enough to be courageous, because you know, for Aristotle, it's the mean between the extremes. So on the one hand, you've got cowardice, but on the other hand, you've got foolhardiness. And courage is this middle ground that Aristotle talks about. So for, for Aristotle, courage required knowing. It required rationality. You had to think through what it was appropriate to be courageous about. Confucius, interestingly enough, in the Analytics, says very much the same thing although in very different words. So it's interesting that we have you know, the guy in the toga and the other guy who's not in a toga coming to much the same conclusion about, about this, one, this one sort of trait. Um, Aristotle said that character is a willingness to die a noble death. And although I'm going to talk about journalistic courage in entirely other ways, it is very hard for me not to say that without also acknowledging that two of my professional colleagues in the last month have been beheaded. And surely, if there is courage to die a noble death, then they would be exemplars of sometimes what it means to be a journalist in very, very difficult situations. Um, feminist philosophers have provided a critique of this. And mostly what feminists say is that it's not really about war or it's not exclusively about war. Courage can also be about understanding that life ain't fair, that people start out on an unlevel playing field, and that courage happens when you persist even though you know that the playing field isn't level and that it's not likely to become level anytime soon. So for a lot of feminist philosophers, they don't talk about courage in war. Courage is a single bold act. They talk about the courage to conceptualize things differently. Um, in ethics class, I would call that the courage of being able to use your moral imagination to envision things that might be otherwise. But they also talk about courage as literally persisting in the face of systemic problems. And regardless of what those problems are, of being able to do what you can to remedy them. Um, that's a concept that I will come back to because I think it says an awful lot about what journalism is and what journalists do on a daily basis. Um, courage includes a rational analysis of contemporary situations. Um, and certainly, um, back to the global nature of this project, courage includes an analysis of global inequity. Um, 
with, and as well as within the nation states. My argument is that courage is a daily activity. Um, too often in journalism, and especially in newsrooms, your adrenaline gets up, and that's when you're courageous. Um, the argument that I wanted to make for my Chinese colleagues is that sometimes it's courageous to come to work in the morning. Um, sometimes it's courageous to do the very best thing you can on every single story that you meet or you report or you edit or you design for or whatever it happens to be. That especially in a country like China that is learning in a very sort of stair-step way what it really means to have a free press and a free speech, that courage to do something well and to continue to do it well, I think is really pretty remarkable. And there are a lot of journalists in China who are doing exactly that. Um, in this sense, courage gets decoupled from fear. And that's kind of where I'm going to leave this paper, that I, th I think professionally we need to think about courage beyond just the notion of fear. But that's, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Okay, so what the heck does neuroscience have to do with any of that? Um, there is a wonderful philosopher slash neuroscientist named Patricia Churchland who's written a set of what I think are really wonderful um, books. She, of course, got the MacArthur Prize about 20 years ago, um, so she's like really dumb. Um, and, but she's also very personable and accessible. And Churchland's project, if you will, is talking about how brain structure, or in this particular case, brain chemistry, influences our human behavior. And her scientifically based argument, which I'm not going to go into at great detail, or actually much of any detail here, is sort of based on the premise that our brain chemistry as a species enables us to do two things that are actually pretty rare. One, we nurture our young for an awfully long time. Just ask me, my daughter's 32. <laughs> OK? <laughs> but that second, we know how to live in groups. And we know how to live in groups in part because our brains are awash in a certain class of chemicals that allow us to damp down some things and amp up others. Um, and I'm, I'm making what is actually a very sophisticated rendition of, of, of Churchland's into, in a very colloquial language. But what Churchland says is that this brain chemistry, which is pretty unique to Homo sapiens, um, apes seem to share part of it, but not all of it. Um, for those of you who are really into voles, um, voles, as it turns out, mate for life, but they fight a lot. Um, so. You know, there isn't really an analog in the mammalian kingdom that has the kind of brain chemistry that homo sapiens seem to share, regardless of culture, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of anything. We all apparently have this. So Churchland says that the virtues that arise from this are essentially that they allow us to be social beings. And they allow people to be profoundly social in ways that most of the rest of the mammalian kingdom is not. Um, she says, in any case, Kant's conviction that detachment from emotions is essential to characterizing moral obligation is strikingly at odds with what we know about our biological nature. The social emotions are a way of getting us to do what we socially ought. All right? so. We have a characteristic heuristic. We have courage, which even for Aristotle was emotional. We have neuroscience, which says, how do people sort of access those emotions? Well, for people, it's about brain chemistry. And what is unique, or appears to be unique about our brain chemistry, is that it permits us to be social in very, very profound ways. I do not want to empirically test this on the commute home from Detroit tonight. Um, as I was kidding with Matt, I could have come and given the tornado study paper here, but we're doing all that badly, so I'm, I'm just I'm going to stick with ethics. My argument then is what journalists need to do is to become aware that there's a range of emotions that fuel courage. That 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 and it's those emotions that actually I think give us power, not just as individuals but as members of a profession. And so I'm going to talk about two of them. 
Um, the first is what my colleague Sandy Borden, she teaches at Western Michigan, and I hope to get her to come here sometime. But Sandy's really written a really great book that basically talks about the notion of professional solidarity, about the fact that you know journalists, when we're just freelancing, um, which many of us are and are increasingly becoming more so, um, we don't have the solidarity of the profession that you get when you go into a newsroom or you get when you meet colleagues for a beer. Um, that there is something about knowing that, um, I'm going to phrase this very colloquially, my newsroom may be a mess, but my profession is less of a mess. And, and the solidarity that comes from that. Sandy's argument, which I buy pretty much 100%, is that it's that solidarity that allows us to access values, that allows us to say, well, even though my boss says I can't do this, I'm going to do it anyway because it's for the good of the profession. There has been some empirical work to suggest that a journalist is a journalist is a journalist irrespective of political system or culture from which they emerge. Now, I buy that only about 51%, but that 51% is really important. And certainly, having done the Global Media Ethics Workshop, I've now met journalists from lots of different places. And within limits, we speak a common language. We speak a common professional language. Um, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining myself to them about why truth matters and why facts matter. Um, and why the occasionally um, uh, opposing power matters a very great deal. Um, and why life matters, um, you know, all of those things. So regardless of whether I'm teaching, you know, very young journalists in Moldova or I'm meeting journalists in South Africa or whether, there is some shared professional solidarity that I actually do think is not just shared nationwide. I believe that it's pretty global. Uh, and there are a couple of interesting um, uh, empirical studies of journalists in multiple countries. The, one, the biggest one I know about is just about ready to get published, which is a study of journalists in 24 different countries, most of them in Central Eastern Europe, a couple in South America, which basically those findings sort of affirm that while there are, of course, great variations, there is also a core that really, that really doesn't vary. So I think Sandy's work is, is really sort of provocative about how we as professionals might think about what it takes to be courageous about. And to the sense that we look to our colleagues in the profession to support us in that kind of solidarity when life gets a little weird in your individual newsroom, and it always will, and it always does. The second person whose work I relied on is um, a guy by the name of Patrick Plaisance who I think, I know Marta is reading, and Stina may have met, Denise may have met also. Um, Patrick's project is, uses what he calls moral psychology, and he's really interesting, interested in investigating in a very deep way what it is that makes some journalists exceptional. Um, why is it that time after time after time, we keep coming back to Edward R. Murrow and saying, that's who I want to be like, that's my hero. Or when, for me, when I come back to my, my friend, Steve Weinberg, and I say, when I grow up, I want to be like Steve Weinberg. Why is it that, that we are able to isolate those people and to hold them out as exceptional? So what, what Patrick has done um, with his colleagues, Liz Skews, who's also at University of Colorado. Patrick is at Colorado State. Um, go Buffs, go Rams, uh, is, um, is to give uh, uh, 32 what he calls moral exemplars, a huge battery of psychological tests, and then to sit down with them for anywhere from two to six hours to sort of get their life story embedded in that, their professional story. So we've got some, what I think is really interesting quantitative data, but also some very interesting, um, what I call uh, biographic data, Matt would call it narrative data, Stina, I'm not sure what you would call it, but you get it, um, about how their careers emerged and what were sort of the places in their careers that they had to make choices. Interestingly enough, Patrick says, um, his book is just out, 2014, if you give me a minute, I'll do the shameless plug, um, is that these journalists never use the word courage. But interestingly enough, 
they're all courageous, even though they don't characterize themselves as courageous. Um, so Patrick's book has a really lovely chapter on courage, on professional courage, and what, and what it means for those folks. So let me give you just some snippets about how these people, these, these exemplars, defined courage. Uh, from a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, quote, have I let somebody down because they needed my ability to defend them and I didn't step up? All right, that's speaking to the powerful, giving voice to the voiceless. That is courageous professional behavior. I would argue it could be professional behavior for a journalist, a doctor. It doesn't have to just be for a journalist, but I think it's a, it's a good definition. From a working reporter, I believe to stand and fight for your goals. You have to respect everyone, and you have to find a way to do less harm for your goals. Um, for those of us who try to work internationally, that part about you have to respect everyone, that really matters. Um, you've got to meet people where they're coming at you, not try to superimpose what you think um, is appropriate. And it's especially important for journalists who are working often in countries where they don't have great familiarity with the folks or the language or the culture. Um, and you know, that, that really matters. From a public relations professional, refusing to become complicit in bad behavior. Uh, in the research that Walter was mentioning, um, my favorite line from one of the public relations people that Renita and I studied was, and then I fired my client. Okay, PR people don't do that often enough, but we act as if they never do it, and I know that that's not the case. Um, so it is, it is a refusal to become complicit in somebody else's bad behavior and hopefully to explain why to them it's bad behavior and they shouldn't be doing it. From a foreign correspondent, it comes down to trying to get good stories, get them right, and get them early. Um, I think about a lot when I think about those two young men who got beheaded. Um, that's all bound up in that, in that sentence, to get the story, get it right, and get it early. Um, this is my favorite one. Um, there was an editor who told Patrick that what he saw his job as was getting the very best out of every single person in his newsroom. And he went on to say, it's easy to get the best out of the stars. The people that he wanted to get the best out of were the people who weren't the stars, the people who were average. And what he viewed his job as was taking that average person and making them better. And that actually is my sort of favorite in, insight from all of these. Um, finally, a person of the female persuasion uh, noted that it was a lifelong struggle for what they perceived as structural inequities in the profession. Um, the New York Times had a woman editor. She lasted for less than three years. Um, we fired her for all sorts of what I think are particularly um, sexist reasons, things that a man would never have been dinged for in this particular way. And I think that, I think that continues. Um, there are some professions where it's becoming less so, but now in PR we worry about it becoming so female dominated that nobody will respect it anymore because no man would be caught dead doing it. Um, so I think those structural inequalities actually really matter professionally. Okay. Um, for journalists, what I think all of this means is you need to meet professional life where it is in political systems that are far from perfect, okay, including this one, but also including the one in Beijing, all right, and within organizations that sometimes promote and sometimes degrade ethical action. That's kind of where courage begins for me in that environment. That's what professional courage is really all about. And in that sense, I don't think it's about fear anymore. I think it's about being willing and able to envision something better, something different, and having the fortitude to every day, even if it's only a little tiny bit, chip away at making that vision come into reality. The last thought I'll leave you with, ooh, I did make the time, yahoo. I think readers, viewers, and listeners notice that kind of courage. Um, I've been a journalist long enough to know, in fact, I was a journalist in the Pleistocene era, so I've been a journalist long enough to know 
that when a person you don't know comes up to you on the street and says, I heard you on the radio, or I read the story, and I want to tell you that it had this impact on me, or it made me think about this, or have you thought about that? I've had that happen enough, and I, everybody I know in the profession has had it happen as well, to say that I think courage gets noticed. But it's not just the courage of the big, bold <coughs> act. It's the courage of doing your job as well as you possibly can in the circumstances that you find yourselves in, and of setting your own goals at a level of excellence that you can continue to try to aim for them. So that's the China paper in English, not Mandarin. And um, I would be glad to talk or listen to criticisms or anything else. I had just a couple of questions, Lee. Um, I, and as you know, I have to scoot out here in just a minute, so I'll get on that. We'll start. I am Howard. <laughs> um, so, wonderful paper. Really enjoyed it. I wish I heard it before I wrote a recent chapter, but uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that later. I'm wondering if you could talk about a couple other terms that seem to be positioned in relationship to courage, one of which you used, and that's the term hero. And I'm particularly interested in how you see those intersect. But I'm also interested in understanding how the term courage intersects with the term fool or foolish behavior. Because your colleagues who uh, engaged in great sacrifice were also called fools or engaged in foolish behaviors, sometimes by their colleagues. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could talk about hero and fool in relationship to this concept okay. of courage. I will not change costume, right? Sandy Borden actually does a really good job of talking about the distinction between heroism and courage. Um, and Sandy's argument, which I, I do accept, I think, it's, I think it's the right way to look at it, is that courage can't require heroes. Because if it does, then there will be half a dozen people on the planet who will be courageous and they'll also be heroes. Courage needs to be a concept that is broadly shared. So her thinking is, is that, and again, I think this goes clean back to Aristotle when we say, oh, you died in war, you're heroic. Well, I have a lot of things to say about that sentence, many of them unflattering. But the notion is that if you have to be a hero to be courageous, that, that quality is not going to be accessible to very many people. And so I, so that's one response, Matt. I think, I think hero is a really high bar. It's kind of like saint, okay? If the only way to be a good person is to be a saint, none of us are gonna get there. Um, if the way to be a good person is to be a good person, and then some people are saintly, or what philosophers call engage in supererogatory behavior, that's okay, but we can all still aspire to good behavior, all right? Fool. <laughs> Um, Aristotle doesn't do much with foolhardiness other than label it. So the closest I can come to it is to say if a person of some rationality and some expertise in discussion with his or her fellows, and I think that what we call that public ethical dialogue becomes genuinely critical at that point then says, I'm going to go do this. That person is not a fool. That person may be incredibly courageous. Now, when I talk about the public ethical dialogue, that dialogue has to be with people who are going to look at every ugly possible outcome. Um, so for example, um, well, I'm, I like to pick on the New York Times, so I'll pick on them again. When the New York Times initially sent people over to cover you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, places like that, um, that was, that was hairy-chested journalism, okay? That was the way that you made your bones as a journalist. You were a war correspondent. Obviously, for hairy-chested journalism, women basically need not apply. Um, enough people got killed, and people got some insights that over the, over the years, now, if the New York Times assigns you to a place, it asks you to talk with your family, it buys you extra insurance, it has actually an exit strategy for you so that should you get trapped in a place that becomes very war-torn, it has made arrangements to get you out. Um, and it will only now send people 
under those kinds of circumstances. You know, you have to have had that talk. Um, does that mean that New York Times journalists have been kidnapped? Absolutely it does. The New York Times won't tell you this, but it has paid ransom. It just doesn't want that known. Um, but I think that's the difference between fool and somebody who actually goes over there with some institutional support. Um, the people I worry about, I, I, I mean, I've heard Ann Girls talk about, you know, she spent a lot of time in Iraq and about all the things that NPR did to help her and ultimately help her translator who became very closely associated with her and then when she had to get out, she had to find a way to get him out. Um, but, she, but she also had a lot of talks with her husband about, you know, what if. So that's not a perfect answer, Matt, but I think it's, it's having that, that ethicists call it a public discussion. It's about having that public discussion with people who don't want you to go or going to say, well, we will only let you go under certain conditions, and you have to be willing to get out, you know, before, before that. Um, I, I think that's, that's how you guard against foolhardiness. Not that you're ever going to get rid of it completely, but I think that's I think that's the beginning of doing it. I think the two journalists who were beheaded were both freelance journalists, so neither probably had those kinds of support systems. And one, uh, the first uh, person who was beheaded had been in another circumstance, had been held, and had gotten out, and his family encouraged him not to go back. Really tried to talk him into not going back, and he chose to go back. Yeah, and there's um. There's a really wonderful doc, um, and I'm going to think of it in a minute, because the guy who shot it is now dead, and he got dead in a war. But it, it essentially talks about what I view as a character flaw, but many photojournalists do not, which is that sort of adrenaline rush that shooting in war provides. And you, he, the, the great thing about the doc was he got them to talk about themselves and their motivation and why they were the way they were, and almost to a person, I was at least able to watch that and say, no, that, that's not me, that's, that'll never be me, and I hope that's never anybody I really love. The other thing that was apparent from some of their stories, not all of them, was that many of them literally did not know what they were getting into. And I think it's incumbent upon you as the journalist, but also on your news organization, if you work with one, to have some sense about what you're getting into. Because some of this stuff is really pretty awful. Dennis? Um, I want to commend you on your, your concept of character being like a muscle. Um, well, I have to leave for another thing, too. <laughs> um, I totally concur with that in regard to the arts, all aspects of the performing arts in particular, um, and also in regard to the martial arts. That, Character is like a muscle that it can be trained and repetition does for 10,000 hours, etc. does lead to excellence and lead to uh, a firm and totally rooted character. So I, I thank you for that concept and I will be quoting you as I always do. I had the good fortune to read this whole paper in advance, so I, I thank you. Thanks, Dennis. And, and I just want to emphasize that I, maybe it's the metaphor that's mine, but it's, it's Aristotle that talked about character as a function of what he called practical wisdom. And, and practical wisdom is not a one-off. You know, practical wisdom is a lived life. Yes, ma'am, but one of the people I don't know. Oh, hi, I'm Sharon Lee. Hi, Sharon. Political Science hi, nice to meet you. Um, so this has been very interesting for me. It's a little bit uh, out of my area, but I wonder um, then, just based on some of the questions we've been uh, batting around here, is um, would you say that then um, courage to quit also fits within this framework? Yeah. Um, you know, you courage to stop and turn away from the heroic, you know, hairy chested battle. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm interested in both the feminist approach and this idea of. Uh, I, I think it comes. So character. I think it comes in two ways. So let me give you the one that I think is the easy access one. Um, it used to be that the only way that you moved up in a newsroom was to take any assignment and every assignment. And the first time you turned one down, it was a professional mark against you that actually never went away. Uh, and, um, and, and since it was mostly men who were being asked to do that, you know, it, it, was, it was hairy chested journalism. Um, as news organizations began to get some sense that sometimes these questions were really inappropriate, 
um, there was a movement, not just by women, but also by men, to say, look, just because I don't want to go to Iraq, that doesn't mean I don't want to go to Detroit. And just because I said no to Iraq, that doesn't mean I'm going to say no to Detroit. And I'm putting up a really bad metaphor, and I get that. Um, so, for example, when I was a reporter in um, Eugene, Oregon, the day after Mount St. Helens blew, uh, my news organization wanted to know if I would be willing to fly over Mount St. Helens in a helicopter. And I thought about that, and I talked it over with my then fiance, now husband, and I decided that discretion was the better part of valor, that I was not going to fly over an active volcano in a helicopter when the motor could get all hung up in the ash that Mount St. Helens was spewing out. In that news organization, I never thought that decision was held against me. And in fact, they didn't find anybody to take that assignment. So, I mean, so that's, that's, the, that's sort of the little instance of it. Um, on a larger scale, I think there's still a lot of Harry Chesson journalism going on. I really do. I still think that when journalists, if you look at who gets a Pulitzer Prize, all right, it's the person or the Edward R. Morrow Awards. Um, or the Peabody Awards. I mean, pick your national You Did Good Award. Um, most of those are for journalists who've gone into dangerous situations. So professionally, I still think we have a long way to go. And I, I will know when we're more towards the way there when the person who gets the Pulitzer is the person who spends, I kid you not, a year investigating the sewers in Detroit and somebody actually and not that the sewers are safe I don't mean to say that but that's not sexy that's not the same thing as going to report on Ebola and and but I think that deserves professional recognition every bit as much does that answer your question yes it does I mean I, I think it really does require a rethinking and redefinition though of courage to emphasize the qualities of persistence and their and um, you know, rationality and persistent practice that you're emphasizing. You know, I've been doing a lot of advising of graduate students recently, and I was thinking about the courage that it takes to leave a PhD program. Um, well, you know, in, in lots of different ways. Yeah, we can so I'm thinking about a totally different type of example, but well, the courage to leave, if, you, if you're already on the ground and reporting a yeah. story in a place that gets ever more dangerous, right? and you've sort of staked out, um, you know, that little piece of identity that here I am on the ground, and then you have to at some point, you know, if somebody doesn't forcefully yeah. uh, demand for your job, then you leave. You're yeah, gonna, there's yeah. there's there's a film that I usually show my ethics students. I suspect I will be again this year. Um, uh, that's about um, the New York Times Sydney Schomburg reporter who reported on um, on Cambodia, um, the killing fields. And at the end of that movie, I always ask the students, who's your hero? Sydney's never the hero, or seldom the hero. Um, the hero is Diff Kron, the Cambodian, who had to stay, who couldn't get out, um, and, and was a person of remarkable courage and humanity. Um, but Sydney's a great example of, of the mindset of journalists in that era. I'm going to go, I'm going to report this story, it's going to make my career. Um, you know, Dith Pond was his translator and his gopher, and ultimately the person who made his reporting possible. Um, but but I, I, again, you got to balance that with a profession that genuinely, at its core, believes that people need to know stuff, and that if we don't know that Ebola is going on in Africa. And that if we don't know that um, there are Soviet, uh, Soviet, listen to me, that there are Russian troops on the ground in Ukraine, that the world is not just a worse place off, but that we can make very, very, very bad choices if that information isn't, avail isn't available. For, so for journalists, it's always a very tough balance, and for news organizations as well. Is that a few? Stina? Um, I was similar to what, what she said, but I, I agree that um, as long as there's a structure in which the awards are named after men, Pulitzer, and I don't know about Peabody, but um, 
and Edward R. Morrow, as long as we measure it by that, and as long as it is always mentioned in connection with hero status, uh, it's, I guess it's the feminist lens again, it's a whole structure that you need to change in order to come up with awards or otherwise to uh, recognize these other kinds of courage. Who notices these other acts of courage of me just walking into the newsroom in the morning and say, yay, I'm going to do it again, I have to pay my bills, uh, and I have to compromise my own ethics um, in order to work in this organization. Um, who notices that? Uh, as long as it's not noticed, how can we change it? So maybe you and I need to start the Gloria Steinem Awards <laughs> for, for, for different sorts of reporting, OK? Uh, and, I mean, and there are people yeah. who do that work. I mean, not, not just Steinem, but you know, people like Catherine Boo. Um, it's real hard to argue that that's not exceptional journalism, but mm -hmm. she's never going to get, well, I'm just going to say she did get a Pulitzer, but she's never going to get, she got a Pulitzer for a book, not a Pulitzer for her deadline work. Um, but her magazine stuff is, is amazing. So maybe that's what we need to do. Wayne State needs to start the Gloria Steinem Awards, and we can give them for the not kinds of stuff. I should write my friend who knows Gloria. Marta? Yeah, um, I, I would like you to address um, also the, the dynamics of the relationship between the journalists and the public. You have mentioned sort of the, the government regime and the, the press tension that exists uh, across the globe, but there's also uh, oftentimes tense relationship between public and journalists, particularly of public seeing perhaps courageous acts of journalists as the anomaly and actually like not a very high uh, evaluation of journalists as a profession as a, as a rule. And for instance, you know, over here uh, in the US it happens, but also uh, in Slovakia the public has very, very low evaluation of press in general and journalists. So, so would you like to address this? I, 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 can't, I can't do it much better than you've already done it. I mean, to me, sort of the, the, the focus um, is the Murdoch empire. Um, what Murdoch has done to the profession of journalism, I would, I, even though he's like really old, I would still like to send him to jail for this because he has, he has lowered our public standing in ways that I'm not sure we're ever gonna recoup. Um, so, and there's a really good book, David Folkenflik, who's the media correspondent for NPR, um, has written what I think is a really good examination. I think he calls it Murdoch's World, um, but it's just it's just out this past year. But one of the things that he comes down to is that Murdoch's leadership set in motion organizations that reflected his individual ethics, and what those organizations have done has been awful. Um, you know, they've spied on people, they've lied about people, they've hacked phones. Um, they've, I, in my, in my belief, they've denigrated public ethical dialogue in Australia, in England, and in the United States. I mean, they've pretty much nailed the English-speaking world. Canada right now is, I think, a little bit exceptional. Um, and so one of the sort of side points that I made here, but I think Folkenflik's book does a really good job of, of sort of like burrowing in on it, is it's, it's not just Murdoch, it's the organizations that he runs that pick up his leadership values by virtue of who he promotes and who he hires and you know, all, of those, all of those other things. And I think that's why Borden's concept of solidarity is so powerful. Because you've got to have somebody that's going to say to the Murdochs of the world, you know, you may be making a lot of money, but you're not doing good journalism. And that's very hard especially in a country like the U.S. where we have this First Amendment that says, you, yeah, you can say anything you want. Um, I, w I wish there were ways that Murdoch could get muzzled. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, everything you're talking about, like the hearing chested, I totally remember that. Um, what is your uh, position on the integrity or the courage of journalism for um, local papers um, which has um, cons like increasingly been like a advertisement for a lot of triple X. Like for instance, I don't even know what happened to Detroit Weekly, um, but the Metro Times. I mean, you're, it's basically, you know, a big 
ad for these different local triple X and I'm wondering if they're taking like the stance of Playboy where they have all this salacious material but they have like really good journalism. Okay, I think some of them don't have really good journalism, but okay. it gets back, you're, you're asking the other side of this question, okay? When does it take the courage to leave? Um, as you know, the business model for journalism is really under serious stress, and so one of the ways that some journalism has gotten around that is with that sort of advertising. Um, Craigslist, from my point of view, is the place that actually is the much more problematic because it's so much more anonymous. But you know, you wanna you wanna find somebody to do kinky sex with, I guarantee you you can find them on Craigslist. You wanna find somebody to to do child pornography, um, which is kind of my only definition of pornography, I guarantee you can find somebody to do that on Craigslist. And there and Craigslist is a really interesting competitor at the local level because it cuts out the revenue that newspapers, especially local newspapers, used to make from classified advertising. So what happens is you have this horrible decision between how do we survive as a publication mm -hmm. and who do we allow to advertise. Now I have to say, okay, in defense of Triple X, but this is me talking, all right? I would take twin Triple X advertisements, truly I would over what in, um, not in Detroit, but in my market in Missouri, are 10 advertisements for gun shows. Now that's all about me as a human being. But you know, the problem that American culture has with sex, I have with guns. And we advertise them in very much the same way. You know, if you're gonna have a big gun show out at you know, Midway where Denise knows, there are uh, there will be ads in the local newspapers and on the local radio station and on TV too. Um, we never ever turn those away, and and that's the place where you know the First Amendment and the business model for journalism. I mean, it's 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 a really serious problem because you may not like sex. I don't like guns. Somebody else isn't going to like chicken from the grocery store. And you know where are we going to? How are we going to work that one all out? But luckily in this paper, I didn't have to. <laughs> yes, I, I want to add that um, coming from Germany with a European background, that uh, it always astonishes me that here, uh, I think uh, something that is a public good, information, uh, journalism, providing information that always we can't get, is tied to profits only. That historically was set up uh, as a private ownership model because the telegraph in 1844, when it was offered to the government, the government didn't take it and they set a precedent, especially for broadcasting, to be privately owned. And that it has such ramifications until now. Whereas in Germany, after the Second World War, uh, the Americans decided it's too dangerous to uh, give the media to the government, of course, because of the Nazis. There was no money, Germany was destroyed, so commercially you couldn't have a for profit news. So they come up with the public service model, which uh, never took here, which NPR is still like a privately owned um, entity. So I think that also plays into this discussion about, um, you know, profits versus courage and the morals being uh, kind of affected by profits. I used to work at a black newspaper, the eldest black newspaper in the state. And um, you have that, like the whole conversation about how we're going to pay the bills, mm -hmm. even more so because, you know, they're competing with the free presses and the Detroit news, you know, but they're targeting um, a, 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 a Pacific demographic that may not be technically as savvy as. And I say that because, um, you know, as far as my job was to, to oversee the website, I was a web editor and a, and a journalist as well. But um, the problem that I kept experiencing or with management was that they wasn't used to the online model. They thought it was a fad at best and an expensive, uh, uh, an expensive thing at the worst, right? Which yeah. affects my job completely. Um, and um, it was it was difficult to justify um, having these online presence, even though, as far as like technology, we're trying to be on par with these other news outlets. But um, I find that whatever the main dailies are experiencing um, financially, the 
the Latino papers, um, the uh, the African American papers. I don't know about um, like religious papers necessarily. Oh, no, it's all across the board. Okay, yeah. okay. It, it just seems like it just seems like an even more problem um, because it seems like still the big the big uh, giants are the dailies, which has suffered a hit. Um, so, you know, we was a we was a weekly. So. Um, well, and I th I think you bring up a really good point, and then I'll, I'll stop. You know, is is for a while, okay, if you want to make a group of American journalism students break out in hives, ask them whether or not they think government should provide subsidies for publications. Um, if they're American kids, they don't understand that that's the model in Sweden and many other Scandinavian countries. It's the model in some countries in Africa. It is certainly the model in China, and I've you know, seen a little bit up close that that has different implications. But the other thing is the web was supposed to fix all this. And of course, what have we done to the web? We've turned it into a mall. You know, so the web, or at least my web, is absolutely every bit as riddled with advertising, most of which I actually don't want, um, than, than what we thought it was going to be. You know, so it seems like every time we come up with a solution, the process of paying for it becomes actually a real, a real focus of, of how we make that happen.